Okay, I think all of our equipment's working and all the rest. I, I want to start on time because I have managed to get myself so far behind what I had planned. Um, uh, I was talking to uh, my uh, colleague and friend, Frank Weislow, who's the dean of the Commons. Some of you may know him. And um, we were uh, uh, agreeing that um, giving a course like this is a tonic after my undergrads um, during the week. Um, someone asked me last week if my undergrads ever applauded after a lecture. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> no. Um, it reminds me of a line about education being wasted on the young, but it is, a, it is very much a, a sense. I get a, I get a great thrill out doing this, but because of that, I probably have talked too long on several of these issues, and I, I, I'm going to suggest to all of you, I will put these lectures on the Internet, and so if I have to skip some slides or I go over and I can't play some of the tapes I have today, please feel that they'll be available, and um, I have a... I know that some of you that may not be as conversant with the Internet, although I know that it's, it's actually not an age thing, actually, although my, my mother-in-law, who's in her late 70s, just is, is positively frightened of computers. So I, I am aware that there is some of that, but, but if you can get someone maybe to, to, to download them for you or to show you, uh, it's very easy to listen to the tapes and see some of this material. Um, I couldn't escape Vietnam today on the morning news. Um, NBC's Today Show had a piece about the Hegel brothers who had served in Vietnam and the influence of Vietnam on the uh, hearings, you know, uh, on Chuck Hegel's views of the use of force. Um, his brother, Tom Hegel, who served with him, made the remark uh, that uh, they're able to commiserate with each other because what they say to each other when things are going bad is, what can they do to us, send us back to Vietnam? And um, it's a line that they've used over the years, I guess. Um, on the other side of the coin, of course, or, or, or separately, John Kerry's appointment was confirmed, and we have a Vietnam veteran as Secretary of State. Not the first one, because Colin Powell was a Vietnam veteran. Um, although I will say, um, uh, a couple of, uh, of, of the Vietnam vets who I've gotten to know, one of them sent me an email that was uh, definitely not terribly in support. It, it, the headline of the email was, Vietnam Veterans Support Kerry. And then as you scroll down, of course, the Vietnam veterans they showed were all North Vietnamese soldiers. Um, so <laughs> it was <laughs> clearly, clearly he, he remains somewhat controversial within that community. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to do a lot of things today. Um, one of the central points I want to get to is, of course, one of the a more controversial and remains a, a hot topic is the question of what John Kennedy might have done in Vietnam, how we can look at that. Um, with the 50th anniversary of the assassination coming this year, there's going to be a lot of discussion about that as a turning point in American history. I've already mentioned it, and I'll try to present you some of the different historical arguments. There is a huge industry in the subject. James Blight has written a book called Virtual JFK and done a DVD on the subject. He's a historian at the, um, Dartmouth University. Um, in which he gathered together and had a conference on the subject of what would Kennedy have done. Um, Oliver Stone's famous movie of 20 years ago now, JFK, posits the entire scenario of the movie is that Kennedy is assassinated because he would not go to war in Vietnam and that Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, and all these people were involved in the plot to kill him because he wouldn't go to war. Bizarre, and bizarre that it did so well, at the time, but uh, you know that movie is certainly out there, and movies do have an effect on popular sentiment. Um, I, as I said, I may skip some of this. I, I suffer from, probably um, as a, a political historian, the, the fact that presidents taped their conversations became an absolute source of fascination to me, and so I spend a lot of time on the tapes. Um, and I'm working now on Nixon and Kissinger, and there the tapes is a, a mother load, you might say, of, of material. Um, for those of you who might be interested in following this on, this book recently appeared called Listening In, The Secret White House Recordings of John F. Kennedy. It's actually not just the White House recordings. They contained in here an absolutely fascinating conversation that was taped uh, when Kennedy was planning a book in January of 1960 and hearing him talk about sort of his plan to become president or his plan to run. Um, I didn't know, for example, that Kennedy thought Edmund Muskie would have made a great running mate. This is in January of 1960, the then governor of Maine. It's, it's actually fascinating, and they're on regular um, uh, CDs. They're not computer. You could play them on a regular uh, CD player. 
um, to listen in on some of these recordings. And it, it, it gives you the transcripts, and it's easier to follow. So I, I do recommend that Michael Beschloss has, of course, two books out on the Johnson tapes that are equally fascinating. Um, there's not as good a set on the Nixon material, but um, uh, definitely uh, there's a lot out there in case you're, you share this interest. Um, it does feel at times like you're a fly on the wall when you're listening to these conversations. It's, uh, you know, and occasionally, even though, unlike uh, Nixon, who recorded everything, um, uh, Kennedy and Johnson did actually have a button they had to push. They left it on a lot of times when they didn't intend to, and you do get some rather frank and interesting discussions because of that. Okay. What I seek to do today is to give you at least my own theory, which I, I developed a little bit in a book I wrote on Johnson called Lyndon Johnson in Europe, about the Kennedy-Johnson years, um, at least in looking at them in the broader picture of the Cold War. Um, Kennedy is elected, I want to remind you, as a Cold Warrior. I, meant, I talked last time about his role in that. Um, he had a strong Cold War record. At the time, it was absolutely imperative for the Democrats uh, and any Democratic candidate to take a tough stance because they had, become critic or they had been criticized for this. Kennedy did take a very tough stance on this. His inaugural address was shaped in part by the fact that only a few days before it, Nikita Khrushchev had given a speech that seemed to challenge the West by saying that the Soviet Union was going to support wars of national liberation around the world. And Kennedy does incorporate that somewhat in his inaugural address. And I, I, I don't have time to really play the inaugural, but I want to put this quote up. Um, he expresses, you might say, two options. On the one hand, the desire, and a strongly put desire, to defend um, the West, the free world. Um, many of you know his line that we are prepared to pay any price, bear any burden in the defense of liberty. But at the same time, he also talked about and used a, um, a quote that uh, echoes Franklin Delano Roosevelt's quote, remembering that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. In that sense, Kennedy saw his inaugural address as a, uh, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, restating America's commitment to its Cold War containment policy, but also saying that we understand the need to negotiate with the Soviet Union, and I think that's clearly there. Recall, of course, that he appointed the best and the brightest, although that term was not used at the time. That was a term later used about the Kennedy advisors by David Halberstam in a 1972 book that did not mean to flatter them with that term. Um, and in fact, though um, they were an extraordinary range of intellectual talent and uh, business talent, uh, McGeorge Bundy, the Dean of Harvard, Robert McNamara, President of Ford, uh, uh, Dean Russ, President of the Ford Foundation. Uh, these were people who had achieved considerable success in the business world, the academic world. I mentioned to you last time Lyndon Johnson's favorite, uh, the, the, the quip that uh, he had talked to Sam Rayburn and told Rayburn about these incredible people that Kennedy had assembled around him. Um, and Rayburn said, yeah, but I wish one of them had run for Congress, uh, um, or one of, and, and effectively saying, I wish one of them had run for a political office. Um, and meaning by that, that there was a sense that this elite was not as connected, you might say, to the American people, that it was a technocratic, brilliant elite, but it may have been a bit divorced from Americans, the common, ordinary Americans' concern. Kennedy began his administration, again, this is important, I think, to recall, with major increases in military spending. Kennedy was determined, Kennedy had uh, argued that the United States had let its defenses rot under Eisenhower. Um, I've been fascinated recently by all the discussion about uh, President Obama and Eisenhower uh, as a comparison now, um, having moved from FDR to Eisenhower, and part of the reason for Eisenhower is this notion that Eisenhower did cut defense spending and warned of the imminence of a military industrial complex, and this fits into what is perceived as what might be a goal of the Obama administration to cut defense. But it's interesting, of course, that Kennedy, the hero of Democrats, was the one who criticized this and who comes in and builds up military spending with, with um, quite a, a considerable build buildup, with an emphasis on both nuclear weapons and starting to prepare for conventional warfare and counterinsurgency. 
Kennedy's argument was that Eisenhower had put way too much on nuclear weapons and that the United States needed to have a variety of tools, including a buildup in conventional forces and unconventional forces, such as those that dealing with counterinsurgency. Kennedy also felt that the Cold War was moving into the third world and that there needed to be much more attention to poorer countries. Um, he proposed the Alliance for Progress, for example, with Latin America as an uh, alternative to Cuba's revolution. Uh, proposed the Peace Corps as a, an opportunity for young Americans to volunteer to serve in a non-military way. One of the conversations I was listening to just this morning um, has Sergeant Shriver calling up Kennedy and saying, uh, you know, I'm finding out that the CIA is trying to plant some people in the Peace Corps. And uh, JFK says something like, they, they better not do that. You tell them to call me. I don't want any CIA agents of the Peace Corps. Yes? I was in the Peace Corps in Brazil, and my, some of my Brazilian friends were certain that I was CIA. It was not a matter of argument that's that I wasn't. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, I, I know. And Kennedy, Kennedy worried about this. He did not want uh, that to be an image, and he's uh, quite firm in his discussion of that. He set up the Agency for International Development. Um, he wanted, in that sense, Americans to make a major campaign. Now, I, I, I don't have time to get into this altogether. At the last session, I, I ended the class by talking a little bit about Laos. I simply want to put this quote up. You can see that Kennedy, in his first press conference, um, says, it's, I think it's important for Americans to understand this difficult and potentially dangerous problem. He says a brief statement about Laos. In my last conversation with General Eisenhower the day before the inauguration on January 19th, we spent more time on this hard matter than any other thing. And since then, it has been steadily before the administration as the most immediate of problems that we are found upon taking office. The irony of this is, of course, if, if any of you have been to Laos or you have any sense of Laos, Laos was probably one of the most remote backwaters of the world. Three million people, many of whom spend most of their time smoking opium at this time and, and, and simply being uh, in a very, it, it, it's not, I, I think, not terribly, I hope not terribly insensitive of me to say it, but it's hard to see that this could be the most crucial problem. But it's a fact of the Cold War that Laos had emerged as this problem. It had emerged because of conflict that had erupted in late 1960 when an American-backed government had been overthrown by what was seen as a leftist group supported by the North Vietnamese. Kennedy was worried that Laos would come under communist domination and would come then to be a, a domino on the way toward knocking off South Vietnam. Um, it was a challenge. Laos had been officially neutralized by the Geneva Conference, but it looked like it was losing its neutrality. Kennedy asked about military options because Eisenhower had told him he might need them. The military told him he would need 60,000 men to go into Laos to fight in that terrain. Um, Kennedy, and this is one of the uh, bits of evidence for his reluctance to deploy military force in the circumstance, chooses to negotiate. And in fact, he decides to go to the Geneva Conference, another Geneva Conference, and in 1962, that conference will reaffirm Laos's neutrality. Of course, it's a reaffirmation of a neutrality that does not exist. In fact, Laos cannot defend its borders, and Laos will, throughout the Vietnam War, be a scenario of a covert war fought by CIA forces um, with an airline called Air America, um, there will be a whole series of, of uh, nor the North Vietnamese will come to dominate northern Laos and then to use Laos as a Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, a technically neutral government will remain in Laos until 1975, but it will have no real authority to control its borders. Laos will be, in that sense, one part of the Vietnam War. But at least on the surface, politically, Kennedy decided to push Laos to the back burner. Kennedy suffered a series of defeats in his early period as president. Uh, this is, again, sometimes lost in this sort of historical memory. But the Bay of Pigs, the attempt to covertly invade Cuba with exiles, fails miserably in April of 1961 when Kennedy decides not to use U.S. air power to knock out Castro's forces or the forces that are killing the, the exiles as they land on the beaches. Uh, the result, Kennedy doesn't do it because he's afraid that if he takes action in Cuba, the Soviets may take action in West Berlin. He's afraid of that escalation. He accepts defeat. He goes to the Vienna summit 
with Khrushchev in Ju June of 1961. Um, he's hoping for some type of an agreement, maybe in the area of nuclear testing, maybe something on Berlin. Khrushchev is emboldened by Kennedy's early, what he perceives as Kennedy's early weakness. He comes to the conference determined to push the young president, who he sees as uh, not in the same, at the same caliber as Eisenhower. If you read the transcripts of the negotiations, it's clear who's on the offensive and who's on the defensive. Khrushchev constantly berates Kennedy for trying to hold back the forces of history that are changing things. He berates Kennedy as a reactionary. Kennedy tries to argue for the status quo, argue for the existence of a divided Berlin and divided Europe, and for that acceptance. Tries to argue that nuclear war is inconceivable, and so that both sides should simply accept and freeze their weaponry. But Khrushchev is the one on the offensive, and um, Kennedy feels himself quite victimized by this. Now, in subsequent years, some have argued that some of Kennedy's health difficulties may have uh, interfered with his negotiations at the time. Uh, he was suffering, particularly at that time, from severe back pain and other issues, possibly. But it's also clear that he was trying to sell Khrushchev on a type of arrangement that the Soviet leader didn't accept. Um, for all of what would be eventually Khrushchev's willingness uh, to deal with Kennedy. At the time, we forget sometimes how enthusiastically Soviet leaders of the time still believed in the progress of history and how they believed that history was going in their direction and that things like the Cuban Revolution, what they were seeing in Vietnam, were inevitable and that um, they needed to be supported. After the Vienna Crisis, Kennedy comes home. He gives a, a very uh, 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 cold, sober speech in July of 1961, um, talking about the need, again, to additional defense spending of some $3.25 billion. Uh, he calls up reserves and National Guard troops, um, which is a significant point because I want to I want to emphasize it because my students often ask me why Lyndon Johnson doesn't call up the reserves in 65 when we intervene in Vietnam. One reason for it is the political flack actually he experiences and sees as a vice president that Kennedy gets for calling up the National Guard and Reserve in the Berlin crisis. Kennedy also makes a strong push for civil defense and fallout shelters. Um, in effect, he scares a lot of Americans. You get the big fallout shelter building period will be in this 1961 period. Um, in fact, uh, one of my favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone um, occurs during this time. It's about a family that builds a fallout shelter holding a dinner party on a night when a radio emergency report comes. And of course, it says, you know, there's an unidentified object, you have to take shelter. And all the people in the neighborhood want to get into that fallout shelter. And of course, you probably can imagine how the Twilight Zone spins it out as the people tear each other apart um, in trying to get into the shelter. And then at the end, it's a false alarm. And then they have to go back to trying to rebuild their little community. It, it was a commentary, Hollywood perhaps, but it also got at the deeper anxieties people had about the prospect of nuclear war, which was genuinely felt um, to be uh, a real and severe danger. Kennedy calls up the troops. He sends additional forces. All of this is happening because of an existential crisis in Germany, namely the fleeing by many thousands of East Berliners to West Berlin, or East Germans in general. Um, again, uh, I don't have to do this with this audience as much, but with my students, I have to recreate the idea of an actual divided city but a city in which you could take a subway ride and be in the West. And that was the case of Berlin before the wall was built, that people could escape easily. And it was, in that sense, an escape valve, as thousands of East Germans, particularly younger and more talented ones, wanted to flee to the thriving and prosperous West Berlin and West Germany. The East German state was going under. And this, as many of you recall, 1989 would be what would be the end of East Germany at that time when people fled. In August of 61, though, the East Germans and the Soviets are not going to let this happen. Taking Germany was one of the central achievements of Soviet power. It was not going to happen on Khrushchev's watch. And in August of 1961, he starts building a wall. Um, Kennedy accepts it. As he puts it, a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war. 
Um, but it is seen, again, as an element of weakness. And what you get, particularly on the Republican Party and Barry Goldwater on the cover of Time at the, this period, is the accusation that the Kennedy administration is weak in the face of Soviet power. This is the context, and again, I've spent a lot of time giving you external context to understanding Vietnam decisions, but this is the context of Kennedy's first decisions on Vietnam that expanded American involvement. Eisenhower had given us a status and a stake in the country, but he never increased the number of Americans beyond 800. There were about 800 when he left office. The situation is deteriorating, though. In May of 1961, the CIA estimates about two-thirds of the country is under communist control. There's a debate within the U.S. government. Some favor troops. Some favor more negotiation. Kennedy sends Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow out in November of 1961. Their recommendations are to increase aid and military advisors, to increase the size of the South Vietnamese Army by 50,000, to begin undertaking covert operations against North Vietnam. And I mention this because, of course, the covert operations will be what will trigger ultimately the Gulf of Tonkin, but they do begin under the Kennedy administration. And um, uh, uh, Kennedy, though, rules out combat troops, and he rules out any negotiation for the neutralization of South Vietnam. In that sense, Kennedy tried to get away with an increase in the advisory status trying to help the South Vietnamese to fight better. But he would not go toward combat troops, but he would also not go toward the Laotian solution. He could accept Laos as neutral, but he could not, because of that, accept South Vietnam as neutral. That would be seen as another defeat. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis the subsequent year plays an extraordinary role in the Kennedy administration and our memory of it. Um, I'm going to play one conversation from it, simply because I think it actually bears on what we're doing. Um, Vietnam fades from the picture after Kennedy makes these decisions in late 61. The actual increase seems to make the war go better. And in 1962, the use of helicopters by the South Vietnamese and American Army seems to actually um, allow for greater South Vietnamese control. And the war, uh, militarily, the reports are, are more favorable. Kennedy's focus is elsewhere, particularly on Cuba and the Russian buildup there. Early in the um, crisis, and some of you may recall that the crisis begins um, in October when Kennedy gets reports of nuclear missiles in Cuba, the, the flyovers by the U-2. They are able to keep it secret for about a week. And in the midst of these secret discussions, they discuss their options. One of their options is a full-scale airstrike and invasion. Um, Kennedy puts on the table also a blockade, and others talk about simply diplomacy. In this particular conversation, which is often and has been actually dramatized by Hollywood in the movie, um, uh, not 13 Days, but I, I, I think, I forget the name of it, the one that came out with Kevin Costner um, in a more recent times. Um, this has been dramatized, um, but this is a conversation Kennedy has with his military advisors and particularly the person in here that is often noted is General Curtis LeMay, um, who has a reputation. Uh, but you will hear how LeMay tries to badger Kennedy toward military action. there with me, yes. Uh, um, LeMay did push hard um, for military action. Kennedy decides not to, to go with the blockade. And um, in effect, the, uh, uh, the, the resolution of uh, 
the Cuban Missile Crisis, which actually involved not just a guarantee that the United States would not invade Cuba, but actually a trade of missiles in Turkey for the missiles in Cuba, was a great success for the Kennedy administration and gave Kennedy um, quite a political bounce, gave him quite... Uh, it, also, it also was a crucial turning point, I think, in the larger Cold War. As both leaders actually faced the prospect of nuclear annihilation, it tended to pull them back from the precipice. And Khrushchev, in particular, seems to have been very sobered by the experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what you see happening then in 1963 is the burgeoning of a very slight detente, an easing of the Cold War. You get the limited nuclear test ban treaty of August 1963, which prohibited nuclear tests in the atmosphere. You get the creation of hotlines between Washington and Moscow to try to resolve crises. Kennedy gives a speech at American University in which he really reaches out to the Soviets and talks about the fact is that we are all mortal, as he puts it. We all have these dreams for our children. We have to get past the ideologies that have divided us in the Cold War. It's a remarkable speech, very eloquent speech. What people sometimes forget is that only a couple weeks later, Kennedy is in Berlin talking about Ich bin ein Berliner as a sort of a, 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 an element of freedom against communism, and in fact gives what is also an eloquent speech, but is a very different tone. And my argument, and the one that I've, I've actually put out there, and I know that it gets uh, uh, different treatment from other critics, and that is, is that Kennedy really had created two contrasting legacies before he died. There was a legacy that moved in the direction of detente, and there was one that still was very firm on the Cold War, and that both were out there. They had the, the, the tension between them had not in any sense been resolved at the time of his death. And this will be, of course, the time in which the real first major crisis of the Vietnam War takes place. And what I mean by this is that this is in, in, in 1963, Kennedy will suddenly now, having dealt with Vietnam, and if you go back and look at newspapers, you'll see that the coverage of Vietnam in 1961, 62, is still pretty sparse. Um, we've got some reporters there, but it doesn't get headlines. In 1963, it suddenly does, and it gets them in a series of things. Um, Kennedy expanded involvement. He brought the number of American advisors in Vietnam up to 16,000. The U.S. now was beginning to take casualties. Not many. Uh, I think the casualties under Kennedy were about 20 or 30 were killed over the course of time he was there. Um, Kennedy set up a strategic hamlet program, which tried to relocate peasants to better protect them. Um, it, it ended up being a disaster, but it was part of this idea that you had to isolate the peasants from guerrillas. Uh, Diem and New, President Diem and his brother New remained firmly in control. There was another assassination attempt on Diem in February of 1962 when a, a disaffected Air Force pilot dropped bombs on the presidential palace, only barely missing Diem. There was still controversy over his rule. The war appeared to be going better in 62, but then the Battle of Op Bak um, revealed doubts about whether the Arvin, the South Vietnamese Army, would fight. Um, um, at Op Bak, um, I'm going to skip over some of this on strategic, at, at Op Bak, um, U.S. advisors, particularly John Paul Van, who's one of the more famous figures and profiled in Neil Sheehan's book, Neil Sheehan's book um, uh, A Bright Shining Lie, um, wanted more aggressive tactics. They had isolated and captured, or at least seemed to have trapped a, a, a Viet Cong uh, group. Um, they let them escape. And Van was incensed at what he saw as the lack of fighting resolve on the part of the South Vietnamese forces. Um, Van, and, and in fact, uh, there was also, uh, I mean, Pham uh, Zuan An, who worked for U.S. journalists, was also a North Vietnamese plant in the group providing information. Yes, I'm so sorry, there was a question. But when those 16,000 troops initially went in, mm -hmm. Their purpose was to be advisors. They were to be advisors. Whether that would be more or less, I think this was a way of avoiding that decision. The idea was to advise the South Vietnamese Army to help it fight better. But they certainly had, they had fighting capability. In that sense, I see it as a decision that allowed him to go either way, either to pull them out and say, we've advised and they're better, or to put in more because we need more. So it, it left it open. Yes? 
what is the capability and, and structure of the South Vietnamese Army at this time? Are these all conscripts who really don't want to be there and would rather vote for Uncle Ho, or are they? Oh, they're, they're, they are conscripts. Whether they vote for Uncle Ho, they just don't want to. A lot of them don't want to be in the army. Okay. Um, the army is heavily politicized. <coughs> ZM decides his appointments on the basis of loyalty to him. There's a lot of disaffection in the army from Buddhists against Catholics. Catholics are favored in the army. There are more loyal divisions than less loyal. It is your classic, I hate to say it in this way, it's your classic third world force. It's, it's an army that's loyal to a leader, but not to a state. There are, there are good military figures in there, and in fact, the United States, one of the things that's quite, quite interesting, if you meet Vietnamese, older Vietnamese in the United States, you'll often find older men that they trained in the United States in these, this period, especially those who played roles as pilots or leaders. The United States is training large numbers of Vietnamese. It's trying, it's trying to build it up, very similar to what we did with the Iraqi army with the sort of leadership and the idea being to try to create a more modern force. So there is an effort. The problem is that ZM has politicized the military forces. Um, the Kennedy administration is not happy about the reporting from Vietnam. Um, I want to play this tape. I was listening to it this morning. Um, it's just interesting to hear how they're annoyed. It's also interesting to hear a little bit of the Ivy League snobism that comes into play here. Um, remember that all these people are Harvard and Yale and the rest. As you can see, it's uh, always, always is a little amusing to see some of that um, coming out. Um, they didn't like the reporting coming from Vietnam, and the Op Bok battle got actually front page treatment in the Times. They didn't like the fact American reporters were concentrating on problems there. Particularly, they wouldn't like it as you get into the Buddhist crisis of 1963. This is the most famous photo. Some of you, of course, I mean, uh, will probably immediately recognize it as the monk who sort of immolates himself in protest against the uh, policies of the ZM government. Uh, ZM had cracked down on Buddhist political agitation. Um, he was trying to, uh, the Buddhists were asserting that they needed uh, better treatment. Uh, they made the case that the numbers justified it. Uh, ZM's very narrow rule um, led to increasing disaffection, and you got this symbolic sacrifice. Uh, of course, symbolic sacrifices are wonderful things, but it's only if you have reporters there, and you have to have coverage, because as many of you know, there are plenty of Tibetan monks burning themselves to death now in Tibet, and no one knows about it, or very little, because of course, uh, the Chinese government doesn't allow Western reporters there to film and to photograph it. So you have to understand that the Buddhists understood the American media. They understood what was going on. And I think, and I want to make this point, that when this photo appears, consider what else is appearing in American newspapers. At the same time as the Buddhist crisis, you have Birmingham. You have these awful pictures in American papers also creating that sort of sense of outrage among people. So although it's a stretch, I think there was a sort of way in which a psychologically many Americans connected the struggle for equal rights in the South with the struggles of Buddhists against a pro-American dictator in South Vietnam. And you got your first major demonstrations against the Vietnam War in 1963. Kennedy 
as any good politician, and he was a politician, that's sometimes lost in the, uh, in the glamour, he decides he wants some bipartisan cover. So he changes ambassadors, and he sends his old Republican rival, Henry Cabot Lodge, out to Saigon to provide, in a sense, some bipartisan protection from what's increasingly becoming a nasty political issue for him, and what to do about ZM and the persecution of the Buddhists. Now, some of you might recall, I won't play it now, but that uh, the ZM government reacted rather insensitively to the Buddhist immolations. Uh, Madame New, the wife of uh, ZM's brother, talked about, oh, the Buddhists, what have they done? They barbecued a couple of their monks. Um, she became sort of a symbol, a nasty dragon lady, you might say, peeling to that, that notion. And, and she, uh, that, that, the, she was a terrible public representative, but she came over to the United States and actually did a tour in which many of these demonstrations against took place. In August of 1963, the Ziem government decides to crack down either, even further, and it sends its troops into the pagodas and arrests thousands of monks. The Kennedy administration is outraged, or at least certain groups within it are, and they draft this cable of August 24th, 1963, while JFK is off vacationing at Iannisport. It's done by a number of State Department figures. I'll read it because it ends up having an enormous impact. U.S. would find it impossible to continue to support the government of Vietnam military and economically unless above steps are taken immediately, which we recognize requires removal of news from the scene. By that his brother and the wife. We wish give Diem to, to Diem reasonable opportunity to remove news, but if he remains obdurate, then we are prepared to accept the obvious implication that we can no longer support Diem. You may also tell appropriate military commanders we will give them direct support in any interim period of breakdown of the central government mechanism. Essentially, the United States government was saying we will support a coup against Diem. It, it, the cable, of course, ends up being very controversial. It comes out at the same time as Charles de Gaulle is irritating Kennedy by calling again for the neutralization of South Vietnam and American withdrawal. Uh, the French, even though they had left Vietnam, continued to use it as a, 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 an instrument to, to uh, criticize American foreign policy, and de Gaulle was in his most critical moods during this period. Kennedy sends a fact-finding mission out to Vietnam after the telegram cable goes off. The administration gets cold feet. It's worried that it has authorized a coup. Um, many within the administration um, object to it. You'll hear President Kennedy talk about that in a minute. He sends off a fact-finding mission, the Krulak-Mendenhall mission. Krulak, uh, Marine General, argues the war's going well. Mendenhall focuses on the cities, and Kennedy does, and you can hear this on one of the tapes, says, you did go to the same country, didn't you? I mean, they basically come back and give him this different point of view. Uh, there was, among the military, this feeling. The military had made great progress, and in fact, um, Kennedy recommends, um, some of his military advisors recommend that we could start withdrawing some of the advisors. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why the, the larger view that Kennedy was prepared to withdraw from Vietnam has uh, taken part, because there was at least uh, planning towards some withdrawal. And there was the withdrawal of 1,000 men as a symbol was going to be used to show ZM that we could go home. But they were going to also code it by saying, of course, that's because our mission has been successful. The administration debated policy on ZM. In this period, from the time the cable is sent in August to the time when the coup takes place, about a two-month period, a little over a two-month period, there are constant debates within the administration. This is not the profiles and courage JFK that you see in Cuba or elsewhere. This is a JFK who's really indecisive and is not able to bring his administration together and who, in fact, I think, loses control over events. Lodge basically takes off in going ahead with the coup. JFK cannot restrain him. You get these debates within the administration and some consideration, but there's no real control. And one of my uh, ones that I, I want to play for you today is Robert Kennedy. This is only a couple of days before the coup actually takes place, but you get some idea of the fog in which Washington decision makers were dealing. Um, and you get it, if you, um, you listen to, to Kennedy, you'll hear some of that uncertainty. I'm going to have to go out on this one. <laughs> 
excuse me for this. Here we go. That's only two days, really, before the coup actually takes place, and it gives you a, a, a sense of how uncertain Washington was of what was going on, um, what they should do. Kennedy was not in this a, a, able to, in the end, define a policy. And in effect, Saigon and Lodge went ahead and did what they wanted to do, contacted the generals, assured them. But ZM indeed was a fighter. Um, when he calls the American Ambassador Lodge on when the coup begins and asks him what's the United States' position, Lodge dodges it by saying, um, no one's awake in Washington at this time. I don't know what the American position is. Um, he wants to fight. Um, Lodge says, I'm concerned about your safety, which I think is a rather insincere comment, honestly. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, ZM decides to fight. He is eventually captured, bound, and executed in a really rather brutal fashion uh, by the military, um, who are convinced that they need to kill him and his brother as a way to prevent them from coming back. Um, should the execution, should GM's murder have been foreseen? I think so. I think they should have known that you're talking about a situation which is extraordinarily explosive. Um, not too many years ago, we discovered this dictation at the Kennedy Library as Kennedy, a few days after the coup, starts talking about this. Kennedy dictated certain um, points when he particularly thought of historical significance or importance. So he does, in this book, for example, you have his dictation during the Cuban Missile Crisis. You have something on Berlin. In this case, he dictated what he knew um, was a, um, something that uh, was important, as he thought, probably for history and for his own memoirs. It's, um, it has a certain poignancy because it's interrupted by his children. And um, you can't listen to this without recognizing, of course, that it's only three weeks before his own assassination. One, two, three, four, five. 
November 4, 1963. The, uh, over the weekend, the uh, coup in Saigon took place, culminated uh, three months of uh, conversation about a coup, comma, conversation which divided the government here and in Saigon. Opposed to a coup was uh, General Taylor. The Attorney General, Secretary McNamara, to a somewhat less degree, got on the phone, partly because of no hostility to the law, which causes him to lack confidence in the law's judgment. Some of the as a result of a new hostility, because the law shifted his station chief. In favor of the coup was state, led by Abel Aaron, George Ball, Roger Hillsman, supported by Mike Parsco at the White House. I uh, feel that uh, we must bear a good deal of responsibility for it, beginning with our cable of early August, which we suggested the coup. In my judgment, that wire was badly drafted. Comrade should never consent on a Saturday. I uh, should not have given my consent to it without a roundtable conference in which McNamara and Taylor could have presented their views. Uh, well, we did redress that balance in later wires. And that first wire encouraged Lodge along the course to which he was, in any case, inclined. Hawkins continued to oppose the coup on the ground that the military effort was doing well. There was a sharp split between Saigon and the rest of the country. Politically, the situation was deteriorating. Militarily, they had, they had not had its effect. There was a feeling, however, that it would. For this reason, Secretary McNamara and General Taylor supported applying additional pressures to them anew in order to move them. Also, we have a uh, 
another test in the Audubon today. It gives you an idea that even at the even at the coup, Kennedy is still talking about the Cold War. Cold War still ever present. Um, GM did, though I think, uh, suffer a very unjust fate by American uh, at the hands of his American allies. Even um, J. Lawton Collins, who had been uh, an opponent of ZM, later said when he heard of the assassination, unfortunately my forecast of ZM's inability to overcome the vast obstacles that beset him proved to be largely correct. Despite this, despite his and our failures in Vietnam, he was a dedicated Vietnamese patriot whose brutal murder was despicable and wholly unwarranted. He deserved a better fate at the hands of his countrymen. Um, ZM's murder unleashed forces in South Vietnam. This is something that it reminds me a little bit, in a dis obviously making allowances, uh, for what happened when we removed Saddam Hussein. That sometimes we think of dictators as wholly personally evil, and then if you remove them, the flowers for flourish, uh, everything is good. In fact, of course, dictators are often dictators of a sort because of the conditions in the country that they're leading. And I think ZM, in a certain extent, was that. Uh, it set loose. South Vietnam was a very fragmented society. It held it together through repression and through techniques that we, of course, disapproved of, but he had held it together. And what happened is you got now, over the next two years, frequent military coups, changes of leadership. The North Vietnamese, as a result of ZM's assassination, decided to escalate the war and to expand and now send in regular North Vietnamese troops. They believe now that the removal of ZM offered an opening for victory in the war, and they thought they could now move ahead. And there was then a much more rapid deterioration in the war effort that had taken place already, and uh, certainly now a beginning of a series of attacks in the cities. All of that began to unfold, and then November 22, 1963, um, and uh, you know, even though I was, I was only nine years old when it happened, I still remember its crystal clarity, everything about it, in terms of being informed and, and what some of the events were that weekend. I'm sure many of you probably share that. Um, let me close with this, this type of a, uh, on, on my, my comments about JFK with, at least let me set forth some of this. Um, what would JFK have done had he inherited the situation that Lyndon Johnson would face over the next um, several years? Some argue, of course, that he wanted to withdraw, and there's certainly evidence that Kennedy um, thought about withdrawal. Um, people later claim that he had said, I'll withdraw after the 64 election. Uh, they claim that he had made various comments on that line. Um, he opposed sending combat troops earlier on, and he had come up with something of a halfway solution of advisors who acted as combat troops and took casualties, but were not officially combat troops in this early period. Others would argue, and there's plenty of evidence for this, um, when the networks expanded their news coverage to half-hour shows in 1963, they did so with interviews with President Kennedy. And in those interviews with Walter Cronkite and um, uh, David Brinkley and Chad Huntley, Kennedy was asked whether he still believed in the domino theory. And he did, and he made it very clear that he thought the domino theory was still valid. At the same time, he also made it clear that South Vietnam needed to reform um, and he made an uh, oblique comment about a need for changes in policy and then said, and perhaps personnel, which was interpreted at the time as a very unsubtle plug to ZM to get rid of New, um, who was seen as the key figure and the key problem. And Kennedy did say in the same message that South Vietnam was their country. And they would have to fight the war, and they, but they uh, would have to live with it. Um, would he have accepted, though, a decision in which the choice was either intervention or the loss of South Vietnam. That's tougher, and it does continue to plague people because of, I think, the mythology of the 60s is that everything changed with Kennedy's death, that Kennedy's death um, began the process of the unraveling of American society, protests, um, divisions. That's a little bit shading and, and I think uh, this, uh, part of the, the problem with nostalgia, but nevertheless it has a powerful control or hold on the American imagination and it's one of the reasons why this question of what JFK would have done remains one we can't answer and it's a counterfactual and it's difficult to even get there on, in any way.
but it, it has become part now of the mythology of the 1960s. Yes? Uh, when you're analyzing what someone would have done or not done, mm -hmm. isn't it very difficult to ferret out what's said for political consumption versus what the real big picture what is? Absolutely. Uh, the question is what trying to get at what's the, the contrast between what might be said for political consumption, which Kennedy did at times, telling people what they wanted to hear, telling um, a hawkish advisor, I'm not going to lose South Vietnam, telling a more dovish George Ball, oh, I'll never get involved with that. Um, so everybody has their perceptions. And certainly Robert McNamara in his memoirs came down and said, no, President Kennedy would not have done it. Um, uh, McGeorge Bundy did not get to complete his memoirs, but was probably leaning in the same way. But others have argued, no, you've got to understand, Kennedy would have faced the same types of political pressures that Lyndon Johnson did. He would not have wanted to lose Vietnam. Losing a country at the time still meant a great deal, and he would have done something. Maybe not exactly what Lyndon Johnson did, but he would not have accepted defeat. It goes back and forth, um, and I think it ultimately is unresolvable, but it's one of those times in which, as a historian, I know you can't answer the question. But I know people are interested, so do I simply say, oh, I'm not going to talk about it, or do you at least try to entertain it? And I, my feeling is you should give the public what they want sometimes. <laughs> and they want to they ask this counterfactual. They want to ask why did this death, did Kennedy's death, which you know, was such a trauma for people at the time, did it make this big of a difference? that we ended up in a war in Southeast Asia. And I think that's, if you, if you um, are interested, I'll put the Blight book on the bibliography I'm doing, but um, it's certainly, and, uh, as I say, it's also a DVD, you can watch it. You can see how he sorts it out. He clearly comes from the, and, and there is a real division within academia of, uh, of a, a very solid core who want to say that Kennedy would have handled it differently. Yes? Yes, very good point. And was he alienated from the administration? Okay, very, very good observation. Let me, let me make a couple of points about this. In late, 19, in late October 1963, a popular American television show did um, a, a program, I think it was Candid Camera, in which one of the themes was, whatever happened to Lyndon Johnson? Um, <laughs> There was, at this point, talk that Kennedy would dump him from the ticket because the scandal involving Bobby Baker, who had been Johnson's key aide in various purchases, um, parties, and other activities in Washington had come. But you're absolutely right. By this point, Johnson was not playing an active role in the Kennedy administration. He was clearly, he was not a participatory vice president of the sort we've seen much more recently. And many people, the, the question of what happened to Lynn John was out there. A lot of people didn't know who he was. And in fact, I think this candid camera went around asking people what happened to Lyndon Johnson. They didn't know who he was. The vice president, in that sense, had slipped to obscurity. Now, I'd, I'd also say that we know that, uh, you know, if you watch Jay Leno, he, when he goes jaywalking in L.A., he get people don't know anything about today, um, <laughs> today's vice president or anything else. So ignorance is not a 1963 phenomenon on that and Johnson's obscurity. But Johnson himself was deeply fearful he'd be dumped from the ticket. He worried about it. Um, he worried that Kennedy would not need Texas as much as he did in 1960. Um, he was deeply unhappy with his role as vice president. He had been drinking, uh, eating much more, drinking heavily, um, having, being much less discreet in some of his other personal behaviors, which some of his aides saw as a part of that. Um, his relationship with Robert Kennedy was non-existent. They hated each other. Um, it, uh, Robert Kennedy was clearly the second most powerful person, and you heard he's the one giving advice. Johnson's not. Um, so yes, all of that. John, Lyndon Johnson is going to come into office without being connected to these. There yes. Was a humor record at the time. Some folks here may remember by a guy named Vaughn. Vaughn that Heater. Yes. <laughs> that, I mean, uh, the, 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 the obscurity in which Johnson had fallen, given how prominent a figure he was, was really remarkable. I mean, he seemed to have disappeared as vice president. And that, uh, I think, does shape, if, you, um, if any of you are reading or have uh, 
thought about picking up the new Caro book. It's, it, it does capture some of this. I'd caution you, he has a few things wrong in there. He's, not, he's, not, he's, he's getting a little sloppier as he gets further along. But he does have an absolutely powerful depiction of the sort of impact right before the assassination and then post the assassination on, on Lyndon Johnson. And I'd like to actually, I'm going to take a few minutes out of what I'd normally do for questions just to, to, to briefly get us started on that because I am so far behind. Um, but I want to I wanna play something of an early tape from Johnson because um, Johnson set up his tapes very quickly. And... Um, I have a lot to say about Lyndon Johnson, having spent a lot of time on him, and I'm going to have to cut my, or, or, or police myself on some of this because I really um, feel like I, I, I got a chance to, to interview and deal with a lot of the people who were around him. Um, I'll come back to some of this. Let me just say that in the background of Johnson's mind was the domestic politics of foreign policy. Johnson saw foreign policy through very much a domestic lens. This is a little bit different from Kennedy. Kennedy saw the importance of domestic politics for foreign policy, but he always approached it with something of a more detached approach. And he always, he often thought and talked about foreign policy in more of a, a clinical or academic set than, than Johnson did. Johnson had been in the Senate during the debate of McCarthyism. He had heard the who lost China arguments against the Democrats. Um, he believed, I think deeply, that extreme anti-communism was a tool particularly by the right and conservatives and then even more moderate Republicans to undermine needed social reform. He saw particularly the lesson of the Truman administration had been that Truman's plans, Medicare, um, advancing various social democratic uh, uh, initiatives, was all undermined because of the extreme anti-communism set loose in McCarthyism, the loss of China and the Korean War. I think Johnson I, I make this case that Johnson, I think, deeply wanted to pursue a type of detente with the Soviet Union. One of the more interesting first meetings of the Johnson administration, he's having a National Security Council meeting, and he reads very slowly a memorandum he gets from McGeorge Bundy about the potential of casualties and conflict from nuclear war. And he reads this very slowly about how the American society would be utterly destroyed, at least 40 million people would be dead within a matter of, uh, of hours. He reads this, and you get the sense of someone who really wants that this is something that's going to prey on his mind and his, his thinking. At the same time, Johnson doesn't want to be perceived as weak. Um, he knows that he is going to be needed to be perceived as strong against communists in order to sustain a policy domestically of social reforms that he wants, and then also a policy of detente with the Soviets. Um, I have a number of tapes, but I'm going to play this one first. Uh, let's see if I have it. This is one of my favorites, um, both for its somewhat salacious character and also it never fails to get a laugh from my students, so I have to, I have to put it up. Let me give you the context of this one. Johnson is talking to Albert Thomas, a congressman from Texas, a good friend. Actually, Thomas was with him the day of the assassination. They, they went back a long way. There's a friendliness there. They know each other well. Johnson um, has been trying to push through a proposal of the Kennedy administration to sell grain to the Soviet Union. This is deeply opposed. This is still a, a, an issue. It's a sort of this notion of trading with the enemy, providing grain, even though Johnson sees this as a very important step. But he's also worried about how politically it's going to be done. And the Congress is playing with him on this. And the Congress, what you'll hear, is going to attach a stipulation that every time there has to be a sale, the president has to come and justify it. So the president has to make the case each time. And we're not going to give you blanket authority. We're not going to give you any sort of a, a blank check on this. Johnson is unhappy with this. And he lets his unhappiness show. Yes, sir. I got it in front of me. 
And it oughtn't to be in there, and it's just a damn... Agency on nice men's connection with the purchase in the reserve. That's right, Danny. Yeah. When the president determines that the president's guarantee would be in the national agency. That's all right, period. And report... No, 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 period. It's the national agency. <laughs> report each determination. Why should I want to report to everybody that I screwed a girl? You screwed one last night, but you don't want to report it. <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about. That made it uh, come on to you, didn't it? Well, don't you think I'm a damned idiot now? Well, no, no, of course not. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to hamstring you. It doesn't hamstring me. It just publicizes that I'm pro-Russian. Right when Nixon's running against me. That's all it does. Well, he ain't going to run, but he ain't going to win. Well, listen, Albert, listen, Albert, listen, Albert yeah. you and I are buddies now, and you understand politics, and I do, too, and I'm telling you that we're working with the Republicans up there 100%. Well, I'm on your side. Well, all right. Well, you just don't ever agree that that's a good clause, because you know yeah. goddamn what it ain't. Don't try to shit me, because I know what it is. Well, I've worked with it uh, in the state. Yeah, you work with it, but you've been working with it on a Republican president, not on a Democrat. When a Democratic president has to report that he makes a determination that's in his interest to go with Russia, it's not good when you're running the office. Now, you know that, don't you? I always use that because no matter how many times I talk about the political elements, sides, that one brings it out. Here's a president saying, look, this is just not. And, you know, it, it, it does it in such frank language and so, so, so directly. It's, it's Lyndon Johnson at his most direct, crude, vulgar, but making a point and making a very clear point that he understands the politics of trying to deal with the Cold War and dealing with the Republicans. The only area that's kind of interesting is his miscue about thinking Nixon would be the candidate. Uh, but, you know, if you go back to 1963, you'll see Richard Nixon has already started to make a political revival. He'd been traveling all over the country. He was actually in Texas around the time of the assassination uh, fundraising. Um, so Johnson's paranoia about Nixon was not unfair. He, he knew that he might be opposed by a Republican who would make the case that the Democrats had been weak on foreign policy and that if he had to make a determination and report to Congress each time he wanted to sell wheat to the Soviet Union, it was not going to be a good thing. So Johnson gives you the politics of that. I also use that as a way, I want to use that as a way of sort of setting up what I'll have to do mostly next week, which is just to say that Johnson wanted to be seen as continuing Kennedy's policies. The great theme from when he walked off or one of the first speeches he gives after the assassination is um, taking up from Kennedy's let us begin from his uh, inaugural to saying let us continue. But of course, he's going to be interpreting Kennedy's policies in his own way. Now, in some respects, our understanding of how he interpreted those policies is very positive. He interpreted Kennedy's death and Kennedy's martyrdom as a martyrdom for liberal causes. He was going to use Kennedy's death and did to get legislation passed on civil rights and anti-poverty. Now, one could imagine a different scenario. After all, Kennedy was not killed by someone who opposed his civil rights policies, at least directly at the, what was known at the time. He was killed by a communist. He was killed by someone who opposed his Cold War policies. But Johnson, in some senses, turns it and turns Kennedy's death toward the advancement of causes that Kennedy had only just begun to believe in. He had only given, Kennedy had only given his civil rights speech in June. Uh, he had not developed an anti-poverty program of any great weight. Johnson decides he's going to use Kennedy's death for those causes. And in one of his first conversations, and I, I, I can't play them all because I would run out of time, I've got one with Martin Luther King in which he tells King, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. And King, King is very enthusiastic about getting someone with that type of commitment. At the same time, what Johnson hears in his first weeks in office, as he's dealing with all sorts of other issues, is how badly the situation's going in Vietnam. I want to play one piece here. This goes to something, the question I got about Lyndon Johnson and his involvement in the Kennedy administration. Let me just play this one as a closing one, and we'll come back to these issues next week. I'll only play about the first half of this. This is with Sergeant Shriver, who we heard or, or um, I mentioned earlier. 
the head of the Peace Corps. He's a candidate fellow. He's got imagination and drive, and he's working right now. I don't know where he is, but he's on the job. Well, how is that deal done? That's what the ball is, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. It's all right. If we could, if we could neutralize all of it, but the yeah, they don't want to neutralize anything but South Vietnam. The goddamn Soviet's not going to let you neutralize North Vietnam, so you just push it through your hat. And the only way to neutralize it is to whip out of it. It wasn't really any better, but terrible, the paper. No, it's, uh, we'll take it. Don't go back. The last two weeks, the last two weeks have been better. It's tied out there. Uh, we, were, we, we weren't, we, 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 we assassinated a few people, you know. And, and that uh, always gives us problems. That's not good. We went in there and killed them all. Now you see what she went. That wasn't smart at all. Smart well, it just wasn't smart at all, my friend. I attended one meeting and they asked me my opinion. I said, if you boys want to play cops and robbers, why don't you get on television? God damn it, let's don't go to do it with that night, because you take you six months to get back where you are now. But uh, uh, they want to play cops and robbers, and they have, so anyway, that's, that's water over the dam. We got I'll stop it there. He goes on to other things. But you hear Johnson. Now, of course, many of you know there's a subtext there. Shriver is, of course, married into the Kennedy family. He's connected there. And here is Lyndon Johnson telling a Kennedy intimate, you know, we've assassinated a few people out there. We, you know, basically saying how badly bungled he saw what the administration had done and had left him in that legacy. It's a nasty bit of work, of course, and the, the accusation that President Kennedy knew of the deaths of of ZM and knew, I think, is an unfounded one, knew that they were going to be killed. Um, in, uh, and in fact, in Watergate, one of the attempts to smear Kennedy would be to try to create a fake cable to that extent, um, and uh, it failed. That, of course, doesn't excuse Kennedy's ignorance or, or sort of a refusal to recognize that might happen, but there's no evidence that we assassinated these people. But as Johnson crudely puts it, that's what the story is out there, and that's why it's going so badly. And it does get to it. He only attends one meeting and tells them he doesn't think this is a good idea, and they ignore him, of course. Um, so you get some idea. Oddly enough, and this is, uh, this is ironic, and I just thought of it, is uh, oddly enough, he actually agrees with Robert Kennedy. That's not a great idea. We shouldn't have gone in with the coup. Uh, the two men, of course, often agreed on many issues and still hated each other, which I, I think is, says something about how political uh, sympathies don't necessarily add up to personal ones in Washington. Uh, uh, sometimes the deepest hatreds can be among people who actually agree with each other. Anyway, yes? Uh, didn't President Jackson convene a meeting before Kennedy was even buried where he announced that they were not going to lose Vietnam? That, uh, that meeting actually occurred, yes, it's occurred in, uh, uh, probably before the state funeral um, and said that he was still committed. And, and that was a whole series of meetings on every issue that we were committed, we're not going to lose Vietnam. But yes, you're right. I mean, he, he saw that. I mean, pre from his point of view, President Kennedy was committed to Vietnam, and certainly there was plenty of evidence President Kennedy would have been in the same league. That's why I think Stone is so wrong about this, because Kennedy certainly gave off the sense that he was committed as well to the preservation of South Vietnam. And his brother Robert Kennedy, uh, when he gave oral histories in 1964 before the, the later escalation, gave the same impression. So to the extent we know it, um, he certainly did. Yes? Uh, there's a lot of talk about neutralization. What yes. would that have looked like? Was there a firm plan for that, or was that just going to be a ruse to let the North uh, it, Vietnamese come in and take over? That's, I, I, think, I think, honestly, Neutralization would be, and I'll come to this later when we're talking about Nixon, uh, something that would later be called the decent interval. Basically, it would allow a face-saving way for the United States to get out, pretending that neutralization was taking place, but that the communists, everyone would understand that the communists would come to power soon. And I think that's how Johnson saw it. I think even de Gaulle and others recognized that South Vietnam was unlikely to be able to preserve its neutrality. And I think it was politically, it was a politically driven one saying, look, you want to get out of this disaster with the least political consequences domestically, come up with some neutralization plan, make it look good, and then pull out. And that's what I think Johnson's saying in the, the reference to Shriver. Yes? One of the slides referred to uh, 
North Vietnamese regulars coming, coming down. South, yeah. Is it appropriate to uh, ask now what's the difference between North Vietnamese regulars, Viet Cong, and the Viet Minh? The Viet Minh, the term Viet Minh, of course, dates to the earlier war and was the, the organization of forces in the first French Indochina War. It stops being operable really after 1954. Then you get two different states. You get the North Vietnamese Army. You get the South Vietnamese Army. The difference is, I mean, the, the Viet Cong were not organized in the same sort of regular fashion. The North Vietnamese military was a classic organized communist military. Uniforms, regular um, uh, detachments, regular rank, all of that sort of thing. The Viet Cong was more irregularly organized and was largely made up of Southerners. The North Vietnamese Army was generally North Vietnamese soldiers coming south, um, just like Union soldiers in the Civil War, coming south as regular forces and not that. I, I gather I'm almost at the end here. Um, maybe one more question, if anybody has it. Is there? Oh, maybe we'll stop. We'll come back to all this next time. Thank you very much. Uh, my students will never do this. Won't happen. Thank you.